Welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the university's picture gallery. Today, our guest is cultural critic and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Margot Jefferson. She is the author, most recently, of the book On Michael Jackson, a wide ranging study of the performer in the context of American culture and history. Margo Jefferson, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Thank you. Well, I have admired your cultural criticism for years, and I'm very glad I could get you here today. Well, I appreciate that, <laughs> and I am glad to be God. Okay. I want you to tell us a little bit about your background, how it is that you uh, trained to write on the subjects that you write about. You're very wide-ranging in your interests, in your writing style, and so forth. What, what, what did you do to prepare for this sort of work? Uh, you know, some of it comes from things that you love and get training in when you're growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I always loved the arts. Yeah. Uh, so piano lessons and dance lessons, uh -huh. went to music camp, all of that. Uh, I went to schools that really emphasized writing, essay writing, and you know, I got props for that. I got, you know, I was, I was good at it. I liked you it. You were rewarded for I it. I was rewarded for it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. And I think I've actually found my way into being a critic partly because I was a hardworking dilettante. You know, mm -hmm. at, at, for a time I thought well, I was going to go into music, then I thought, no, I'm going to be an actress. Mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> then I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be an academic in American studies. And then I finally decided a few years out of college, um, you know, I really do, I do want to write. And I'm not sure what I want to write, but I love culture and I love thinking about it, so I'll be a critic. And you are a critic for a general audience, um, a certainly an intelligent, intellectual audience, but nonetheless, not for an academic, narrow audience. Was that something you intended? You said you thought about being an academic, and then I guess you moved in a different I direction. I respect it enormously. Mm. Um, but the people I, I was reading when I went to graduate school in journalism and decided, I'm going to do this, mm. were all fiction writers who were also critics or mm. literary critics who wrote you know, fiction or poetry or just wonderful writers like Pauline Kael or Otis Ferguson. Or, you know, I was very lucky to be um, in college and graduate school also when this thing they now call new journalism mm -hmm. was exploding and when writers like older writers like you know, Baldwin and Norman Mailer were realizing that you know nonfiction was as experimental and, and noble and all of that and valorous yeah. as fiction. So you know. creative nonfiction exactly. is what caught exactly. your interest. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that's yeah. what you do and so well. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> criticism can be called creative nonfiction, but oh, absolutely. But we yeah. like to think that it. Yeah. Now you write on art, music, theater, books. I'm probably lo no, leaving out. Not very much on art. More, more mm. often, um, let's say, photography, but okay. occasionally fine art. I like writing about fashion. I've written on film. I like thinking about how the arts you know, merge and influence each other, and you know, also just about cultural phenomena. So tell me, which of the arts, I know this is kind of a simplistic question, but which of the arts is right now, I guess number one, interests you most, if that can be said, and is most ascendant, do you think, in American culture? Ah, well, those are two different questions. Uh -huh. um, movies and pop music in, um, are ascendant in, in, in American culture, and probably in global culture. Um, you know, I, I could include television in that, but you know, film in the, in the broadest way. Yeah. Yeah, that's completely taken over from theater, um, dance, which I adore. Yeah. Will yeah, you know, there is there is vernacular dance. Um, any other kind will always have a small audience, and you know, poor theater is slip, 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 sliding away. Is that your first well, love? Theater? You know, no, yeah. actually, I love any kind of performance. Mm. Um, but you know, I'm you know. Reading is a great, is an intense pleasure to me, and I couldn't live without um, 
music, and I often write to it. So, you know, it's tricky for me to say, but I have no problem answering that question about what's, what's dominating okay. right now. Okay. Tell me, because you mentioned television, what do you watch on television? I'm just curious. Oh, what do you like? a funny mix of things. <laughs> um, some news, okay. you know, sure. Um, I, you know, channel surf. Um, uh -huh. I watch the tennis channel. You do? Yes, okay. yes, 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 I yes, love yes, to yes. watch I'm a big fan. And various HBO shows. Um, what I shows? Big, I, watch, well, I did watch The Sopranos. I loved The Wire. Um, the modeling shows I will watch. America's <laughs> Top Model. Yes, okay. yes. yes. And, you can you know, do I'm that On the runway. Um, so. Well, mm. it's part of, I guess, you are really on the pulse of popular culture, even as you, and I guess I want to ask you that, too. Do you make these distinctions between high culture and mass culture? Do you think they're relevant? Uh, um, no and yes. In terms of what we care about what it, what matters, what we love. Uh, no, you know, and and history shows us that. Mm. You know, there's so many forms that started as so-called, you know, debased low culture. You know, classical musicians for years have thought, I'm not interested in folk music. I'm not interested in ragtime. You know, jazz is charming, but no, no, no. You know, then yeah. comes rock and roll, and and then it all, you know, it, that's over. It changes. That's, that's, yeah. yeah, that's done. But do you know different? You know, the high art often functions. You know, certain conventions are different. Um, absolutely, and you yeah. respect that. And yeah, yeah, I acknowledge it. I respect it. And you know, you have to. I, I, I'm, I'm a pragmatist because I've been a working reviewer. You have to understand what the conventions and the history of a forum are. Yeah. So well, that's that's you know. true, and I and that's that comes little... through so strongly in this book, oh, where good. you are. Um, well, you, first of all, I guess I want to ask you whether people were surprised that you wanted to write a full-length book on Michael Jackson. Um, some were. Mm. Uh, it, some people would say, oh, you know, oh my God, that's so interesting. <laughs> now, uh, I was very moved by the fact that dance people, all of them, um, would say to me, are you going to write about his dancing? You're really going to, aren't you? Yeah. And that was moving to me because they got, you know, and so you felt the dance people, people in some ways understood better immediately than some of the so-called pure music people. Yes. Yeah. Well, and though music people knew there was stuff there, but everyone, you know, has their own, mm. you know, that's, you know, that's my music. But they got that. But dance people felt he hasn't been given his due as a dancer. And, you know, these were ballet critics, modern critics, you know, pop dance critics. And that, I thought, yes. Mm. Um, there certainly um, were people who said um, things like, Margo, you know, I've admired your work for so many years. Um, frankly, I was surprised that you wanted to <laughs> write. <laughs> <laughs> These were the snobs of the profession. Yeah, you know, you probably could have predicted it. Right? Or as, <laughs> as someone sniffed to um, a friend of mine, you know, an academic who had um, wanted me to read his book, which at that point I didn't have time to do it. And my friend said, um, well, you know, she's, she's working on a book. I said, well, about what? She said, well, about Michael Jackson. And he drew himself up and said, what could she possibly have to say about that? Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, well, it, it's interesting. You talk about him as a dancer and as a musician. Was I know that's what drew you in to writing, but then you really write in cultural history. I'm and, wondering and which that came drew first. me in both, too. Okay. You know, I was in my early 20s when the Jackson Five appeared yeah you know, so i had a wonderful time with them but yeah. i i'm not of that generation and they they're fascinating to me who literally grew up immersed you know yeah. in michael jackson so i i watched him grow um, i'm fascinated by child stars yeah and, you know and to watch him pull it off you know become a worthy innovative superstar musician dancer filmmaker that was fascinating then, you know, all the cultural conundrums started yeah. to creep in, and, you know, it just became, you know, um, something fascinating to watch because he was so talented. A part of me, you know, always wanted to kind of stand up for him. Then when all the sexual stuff exploded, you know, it, it just became, you know, such a, so many elements of, um, of American cultural perversity, private right. and public, began, 
you know, to enter. That's what I find so fascinating about this book. It's both a celebration of talent and it's using Michael Jackson as a lens through which to see American culture in all its oh, multiplicity, yes. its greatness, its perversity, its pathology, its exactly. weirdness. It's, yes, its need it's to devour <laughs> yeah, I mean, people and to be sick of it, you know, yeah. um, at the same time. It's all there in this one personage. That which is staggering. It's yes. staggering. Yes. I wonder if you, one idea that is a motif through the book that's so fascinating to me, and I wonder if you'd elaborate on it, is the idea that Jackson was both the impresario, the sort of P.T. Barnum, and the product or the freak or the spectacle at the same time. And I, there's very, perhaps no other example of that uh, it, con condensing. No, I think that that's, that's right. I mean, if you think of someone like Elvis, you know, who mm -hmm. is every bit as important to the culture and has X number of, of decades on Michael, you know, he was a great performer. But, you know, he was more the, the product of, say, the manipulations of Colonel Tom Parker. He had opinions, you know, he had passions, but the business, usual, so often a star is shaped handled, by shaped, someone else. shaped yeah. by in terms of marketing. Mm. Um, you know, he's the businessman. He, now, he's made a lot of mistakes since, but, you know, this is the one who brought the Beatles catalogs, you know, who built, mm. um, you know, who turned Neverland before it became this <laughs> very, very strange and perverted place, you know, into um, the only heir apparent to Disneyland, uh, you know, who became a multimillionaire and who became a video innovator, you know, in terms of videos in which he starred constantly. I think it has something to do with the level of technology uh -huh. we've arrived at because, you know, the culture is, is so self-reflexive and self-referential. Every, every art form is commenting on itself mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, now, and you know, everything is, is real and yet virtual, you yeah, know, stimulated, yeah, yeah. Genu yet, yet genuine. So the tools were there and for the him. The tools mm -hmm. were there for him, but my God, he used them so extraordinarily. Do you think that has something to do with his being a child star? So he entered the industry so young, he learned the world and the context and the tools, so then he could apply. I think it did, but um, again, a, not, a lot of child stars are, are entirely tools. Yes. He was a voracious child star and an extraordinarily gifted one, but for a time, he really did love what he was doing, you know, and he would you know, the brothers would do their job, but he would avidly stand in the wings, you know, memorizing, learning. And Watching. In, yes, exactly. And in that way, he goes back, you know, to that older generation of, you know, these kid vaudevillians, you know, be they you know, be Buster Keaton or Sammy Davis Jr., you know, uh, they, you know, it's in their, it's in their blood and bones, and they absolutely, you know, it's, it's, it's second reflex, second nature to them, That's and they loved it, and they knew it, and, you know, it's a little sad that people like this don't know anything else. I mean, mm. Michael Jackson rarely had a day of school in his life, and that doesn't just mean education. That means he was never around everyday people mm. and around people who were not members of his family with whom he could make friends and that's grotesque and do you think that accounts for the going over the edge i think it has the has unreal world within which he huge, circulated hugely yes and you know in every way this family was so locked off um, the the mother being such a jehovah's witness the father being you know the ultimate manager of the son's careers, mm -hmm. being a failed musician himself didn't help. You know, then there's um, all the brothers, and, and then the three rivalry, sisters, yeah. and the sibling rivalry. So you're performing together, you're living together, you're traveling together, uh -huh. 